My name is Ron Hendel. I'm the chair of the Jewish Studies program here at Cal. And I'm very delighted to welcome you to our second annual Berkeley Seminar in Modern Jewish Culture. This is a nice little room. Usually, usually we have smaller rooms than this, but this is, this is a very nice venue. I think we'll keep it. <laughs> uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce you to Michael Shabon, who is our guest tonight. Uh, he's a novelist, as all of you know. He's written all sorts of wonderful novels. Um, won a big prize for The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. Has a great novel about a Yiddish policeman in Alaska. <laughs> and I just read a really nice book of essays. His latest work is called uh, Man Manhood for Amateurs. Yeah, and I, uh, as a father, I can relate to many of the things he says in there. It's very, it's funny, it's wise, it's poignant. It's also funny. I just want to read, read to you one line that, uh, that just, it goes by very quickly, but this, 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 this uh, uh, hit a point with me. He says, uh, it turns out that there are only nine different ways of being a father, and eight of, them are eight of them are distinguishable from one another only by trained experts from Switzerland, and the ninth is exactly like the others, only more so. <laughs> So I'm pleased to tell you, I don't know if my wife is out there, but I'm number six. I'm type number six. Uh, it's a wonderful book. All of it, and, and I also want to say for fans out there that uh, uh, he wrote the screenplay for Spider-Man 2, which broke type by being better than Spider-Man 1. So this puts him, I think, in the rare, com rarefied company of Francis Ford Coppola and probably no one else <laughs> for whom the second uh, was better than the first. So it's a great pleasure. He's a local, local boy made good. He lives in Berkeley, and it's just such a pleasure to have him here. In, t <clears throat> Interrogating him tonight, I mean, not, excuse me, <laughs> in conversation with him tonight, uh, to his right is my dear friend and colleague Robert Alter, who's a professor in the uh, Comp Lit and Near Eastern Studies Department. I have to say that in the lovely little postcard that was sent out, it says, uh, in conversation with Robert Alter, class of 1937 space, professor <laughs> of Hebrew and comparative literature. Now he's not, he's getting on in years, I must say, <laughs> but he's not the class of 1937. <laughs> which would make him roughly 95. <laughs> By the way, Bob, you're looking marvelous. <laughs> but this is actually the name of his chair. He's the class of 1937 professor of ah. Hebrew and oh. See? <laughs> we teach critical reading skills here at Berkeley. <clears throat> so Bob is also the author, Bob is the author of a lot of, uh, a whole bunch of scholarly uh, novels, all of which are wonderful. Did I say novels? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not novels, but scholarly mm -hmm. books. Uh, he, I would say the preeminent literary critic of our time. Uh, his range stretches from uh, the modern novel, uh, Hebrew literature, the Bible, medieval literature. It's just disgusting how much stuff he covers. <laughs> uh, and I just want to say his latest book is called Pen of Iron, American Prose and the King James Bible, which talks about the style of the King James Bible wow. and how it permeates the style of uh, many uh, modern American novelists, uh, including Abraham Lincoln, who wasn't really a novelist, but he, he's in there anyway. So let me, just, let me warmly welcome my colleague Robert Alter and give the show to them. <laughs> Okay, uh, Michael, I'd like to start by uh, having you talk a little bit of, about your interest in tough Jews. And I'll explain for the benefit of those who haven't read all your novels that uh, Michael Chabon's first novel, Mysteries of uh, Pittsburgh, has a, a central character who's Jewish, his name's Beckstein, whose father is a kind of capo de mafia. Mm -hmm. and. And then in uh, Cavalier and Clay, of course, we have these two young Jewish guys who, who have invented an indomitable superhero. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and uh, that we have two um, equally indomitable professional fighters, mercenaries in, in the 10th century, in, in gentlemen of the road, and then uh, Jews as uh, hard-boiled cops as well as criminals in, in uh, the Yiddish Policemen's Union. So uh, tell us a little about what, what draws you to this subject. Well, it's you know autobiographical, clearly. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, after I was, my career in the ring was finished, I was you know, looking for something else to do. Um, well, I think like maybe part of the answer would be that like most uh, American Jews growing up, uh, I both knew personally and heard stories about uh, various kinds of tough Jews, whether they were uh, supposedly had been mobbed up in some way or another, or uh, had served, you know, I remember these uh, great uncles of mine with uh, who had served in World War II and with their sailor, you know, tattoos on their arm, a couple mm -hmm. of guys that seemed like very impressive, impressively tough guys, um, but who were also, strangely enough, Jews, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, um, there m I might have had a sense sort of looking around at the, the, lit the at, at Jewish literature, at, at, at novels and, uh, and fiction about Jews, they're, they're, they're uh, maybe in the most popular representations of Jews, that type m might have been a little more absent on, on screen or on the page than, mm -hmm. it, than it seemed to be in my life. Um, but also there were plenty of representations that you know, the eye could be drawn to, whether it was in a work, you know, certain books of Saul Bellow that feature, you know, he had us fondness for tough Jews oh, yeah. and, uh, uh, or in um, you know, certain gangster films. Um, there are scattered portrayals here and there that you know, the, the attention of a young Jewish boy growing up might light on as possible. Now, did you read uh, Isaac Babel's Ben Ya Crick stories? Not till I was older. And I mean, the uh -oh. first I heard of them was um, actually in um, The Ghostwriter, in Philip Roth's uh -huh. The Ghostwriter, where yeah. he, creates his, it, he creates a kind of tough guy, Jewish writer, I guess maybe may partly modeled on uh, a little bit on Norman Mailer, maybe a little bit on Saul Bellow, I don't know, but um, who, and he talks there about Ben Ya Crick, the Ben Ya Crick stories, and, and that drew my interest right away, and then that is the point at which I, mm -hmm. I checked those out. Um, and I went back to those stories uh, repeatedly while writing the Yiddish Policeman's Union. Because yeah, that makes sense. And trying to yeah. create a Jewish underworld, a Jewish right. gangster world, you know, I was looking for literary antecedents of that, and that's one of the few truly literary um, antecedents uh, of Jewish mob, Jewish gangsters. Um, but, you know, I think that the truest answer to your question is probably just, in, in most ways, what I write reflects to some degree what I like to read. And what I'm drawn to as a reader, what I take pleasure in as a reader. And though certainly it doesn't form the, an exclusive part of my readerly diet, I do love, I, I am drawn to very sort of hyper masculine kinds of narratives. I love Cormac McCarthy, Blood Meridian's one of my favorite books. I love Raymond Chandler. Um, uh, I, I, I have a taste for boys' books to a certain mm -hmm. extent. And I think it's natural that that taste, you know, would try to find ways of of expressing itself in my work, but I, that, but but I do have this. I do feel this need to sort of put a, put my own twist on it, put a different spin on it. And one of those ways, definitely. I mean, you're definitely putting a new twist on something when you take a Jew and put a sword in his hand. Yes, right. I mean, <laughs> there just aren't that many books about Jews with swords. Um, it's a fairly right. short <laughs> shelf. I mean, they're there, and certainly. I mean, yes, the Maccabees and. And Bar Kokhba. That doesn't take you too far. No, really. And there was a kind of a big gap in there. Um, uh, but, but in fact, you know, and this, and I, you know, I guess in a way, part this, this is this part of partly motivates a lot of what I've been doing lately. Is and, and it, in a way, it's um, I haven't really thought about it till now. But growing up as a kid, as a Jew, reading the educational material that's prepared for you, that the little uh, maybe in in the in the Jewish newspaper. 
that we would take, um, that would come every week, um, there'd be this little box that was like famous Jews in history. Oh, you know, yes. Right? <laughs> and, and every so often, there'd be this, uh, you know, like Moses Montefiore was a, was a soldier, right? And, or, or, you know, you'd read about these sort of martial Jews or these military Jews that are sort of unknown. They were generals in the Civil War. They fought for Napoleon or whatever it might have been. Um, and I was always intrigued by that, always drawn to those sort of footnote uh, and not just when it comes to tough Jews, but in general. So like reading about this crazy proposal that was put forward by the Roosevelt administration uh, in 1940 to allow Jewish refugees to settle in Alaska. You know, I, I think I probably came upon that first in one of those funny little you know, footnotes uh -huh. to Jewish history yeah. or in some book about Jewish history. It was always the stuff in the margins, um, the stuff in the footnotes, that's where at least in my case, I tend to find you know possible subject matter for for novels and things to write about stuff that hasn't been looked at. Now you may know that in uh, this is something that one of my colleagues here at, at Berkeley, uh, John Efron in the history department, mm -hmm. is very interested in that in late 19th century London and early 19th century London, some of the the top prize fighters were Sephardic Jews. Oh, there was right. a guy named M Mendoza who was a real killer. So you might pick that up. For yeah, a I've been looking at that. Oh. It's funny that you should mention I've been thinking about the bare fist, the bare knuckle boxing thing. Right, right. They, that's where they fought. It doesn't get tougher death. than that, does it? Right, right. No, no. And I mean, it's, you know, it is a persistent, it's not right that the stereotype should be what it is. And when I say that I'm of a Jewish man, which I mean, you know, is sort of like somehow professorial, or retiring or, or engaged in one of the professions. And, you know, when I talk about Jews with swords in the afterward to that novel Gentleman in the Road, I talk about, you know, if you think of a Jew with a sword, you picture Woody Allen in Love and Death, right, you know, right. sort of like <laughs> backing out of yes, a room right. with the, the saber kind of wobbling in his hand, you know, and, and, and yet, you know, in, in so many realms, in whether it was a professional basketball or in the first part of the 20th century That's in this right. country yeah. or prize fighting in the, in the you know, lower, in the lower way classes, um, you know, you've always found Jewish men engaged in, in the kind of stereotypically manly pursuits, and, uh, and yet that never been allowed to form part of the received stereotype of what a Jewish man is. <clears throat> Let's talk about style a, a, a little bit. I mean, I, as a reader, find you a, a very interesting style. Oh, I thought you meant... Yeah, my shirt. Right. <laughs> right. No. <laughs> and uh, you can't beat my colleague Ron Hendel, whom I've seen a in jacket. A, a jacket for the, the first time in my life. <laughs> I'm looking very sharp. <laughs> yeah. To boot. Um, I, I kind of sense, uh, but maybe this is wrong, uh, a, a certain evolution over the years in uh, the style of your novels. Hmm. Um, I mean, the, the, uh, the prose of the first book was certainly very serviceable and had little, little moments of liveliness, mm -hmm. but didn't seem that unusual. And it got unusual. And what I, I notice is in the later books is a kind of exuberance, mm. which is something that I find delightful. Thank you. Uh, my secret favorite in this regard is uh, The Final Solution, mm. where the, the prose is sort of... A, the, the main character is a very elderly Sherlock Holmes, and uh, the prose is a kind of pastiche of Edwardian prose, maybe mm -hmm. a little Dickens uh, mm -hmm. thrown in. But it, it's also interesting in its own right. It's not just pastiche. So talk a little about well, your style. Um, sure. I mean, specifically in that case, I definitely I knew when I once I had the idea to try to write um, a work about Sherlock Holmes that would that would use the character of Sherlock Holmes, the figure of Sherlock Holmes. I knew right away I didn't want to write um, a straight ahead pastiche of Conan Doyle, of Dr. Watson. I didn't want to do that, um, partly because I had already done it. Um, the first thing that I ever wrote in my life that where I really sat down and tried to write a sustained work of fiction when I was about 11 years old was a Sherlock Holmes story. <laughs> and in that case, I very much, I was real. I love Sherlock Holmes and right around the time when I fell in love with Sherlock Holmes, this novel by Nicholas Mayer came out called The 7% Solution, which uh, I'm yes, sure sir, yes. most people probably are, are familiar with or have heard of at least, um, which was a, one of, 
they didn't, didn't know it at the time. After, yeah, right? they did. Yeah. A pretty yeah. good movie, too. A fun yeah. movie. Um, and there had been a long tradition of pastiches of Doyle. I didn't know that. All I knew was, here is this novel by this guy who wasn't Arthur Conan Doyle that was narrated by Watson, written in that very familiar, very recognizable voice. And, you know, what chutzpah? Like, I didn't... Yeah. I didn't I, uh, it was a revelation to me to know you could do that, that you were allowed to do that. And as soon as I realized that, uh, it gave me both sort of the, the, the inspiration and the inkling, but also kind of the courage to do it myself. Mm -hmm. And it's that impulse, you know, to do it yourself, I think is what underlies, you know, most people taking up uh, a pen or a word processor for the first time. And you, you love something and you think, I love that so much, I want to try to do it myself. Well, here was this license to literally write the same thing that I was loving. And so I, I when I started writing The Final Solution, I didn't want to do that. I, I knew I could do it, and I probably could do it better than I had been able to do it when I was 11. Um, but I, so what I, I guess what I decided was I, what I wanted to do was I, I wanted this novel to have a real psychological depth to, to, to sort of stay really deep within the consciousness of the, of the characters almost to the point of stream of consciousness, so that you'd be so intensely inside the point of view, and the point of view shifts throughout the short novel, the novella, from chapter to chapter, it moves among several different characters. And because I was doing that, because I was planning to do that, that was more of a Robert Louis Stevenson um, mm -hmm. technique, is to change point of view, or to have short novels that are broken into chapters that move around point of view. Once I had decided to do that, it seemed incumbent on me to go really deep. So once I said to myself, well, deep psychology, deep point of view, and it's taking place, it's taking place during the Second World War, but it's in, in, in the minds of these characters who are sort of Victorians or, yeah, or Edwardians sure. themselves, I thought of Virginia Woolf. And, and, then, and so some, I kind of just made it my, my clue to myself to think, well, if Virginia Woolf had written Sherlock Holmes, like, how would she have done it? And, and that, I mean, I'm not saying the writing reads like Virginia Woolf, and I didn't no, try to doesn't. parody Virginia Woolf, or I didn't substitute imitating her for, for imitating Conan Doyle, but it, that was the clue for me to sort of, in terms of diction, in terms of, you know, in a way that when you're, when you're writing a novel, you're not, you're impersonating your narrator. It's, almost, it's a performance, it's like being an actor. So, and the character that I'm playing is not the characters in the book, but the narrator. That's my role. And so then I started to imagine my narrator and my narrator was British and my narrator was well educated and my narrator would have received a certain standard of diction. And, and so I, I, it was in imagining myself to be that narrator that the, the prose you know, resulted the way that it did. And then at that point, once I had finished it, I took it and gave it to some British friends of mine to make sure, it's, you know, to help me weed out the Americanisms and the diction and to sub hopefully substitute more authentically British things. So like I had, I had the character um, sort of exhorting the little boy by saying, um, um, that's the way, that's the way, something like that. And, and my friend said, no, he should say good lad. So I changed it to good lad. Um, <laughs> uh, I noticed that raisins were sultanas. Exactly, and, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, and that's yeah. that's p part of the pleasure of writing is to you it, because it is a performance because you are acting it out. Then, like a good actor, you know, you want to research your part. You want to you want to get a sense of how how well, how would this be said by this person whom I'm imagining telling the story. And it might be the the process that you're that you you spoke about when in the beginning of your question is just that I've um, come to realize that maybe more. Um, you know, that, that first narrator of that first book, Mysteries of Pittsburgh, is someone extremely close to who I was at the time that I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between us. Um, and part of what I have think I've tried to do, I mean, even with my second novel is narrated by Grady Tripp, the first person narrator, is somebody who I set out very deliberately to not be like myself because mm -hmm. he, I, was, I, had, I was trapped in this novel I had been working on at the time for about five and a half years, and I was in, living in grave fear of becoming one of those writers who writes the same book 
you know, Harold Brodke or Ralph Ellison, um, you know, that you get trapped inside that book and you never get out. And, and I knew I had a teacher in college who had faced a similar problem. And so I kind of created Grady Trip to be not me, to be the opposite of me, to have all of the characteristics I didn't have and put all of that bad mojo on him. Um, and so that was sort of the first sort of deliberate creating of a narrat narrat narratorial persona. Um, and with Cavalier and Clay, that became this omniscient narrator, somebody much smarter than I am, much better informed than I am, someone who had a vast command of um, world, the sweep of world history at his fingertips. That was, a, you know, my greatest impersonation so far. Um, but again, I mean, that's part of the pleasure of doing it is that you get to be somebody else. I get to be somebody much smarter, much wittier. Um, you know, in a way, writing a novel is just like one massive exercise in um, l'esprit de l'escalier, you know, that you, all those things that, oh, why didn't I say that? And when yeah, you're writing right. a novel, yeah. it's like you can. Like, <laughs> you have 20 minutes to come up with the perfect rejoinder. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's part of the pleasure of it, too. Well, I, I have to say, as a reader, I, I think your, your project has been very successful because it seems to me that your novels are more different from each other than most no novelists who produce a number of books, uh, and, uh, and it's part of the pleasure in reading you. But if I can follow up uh, mm, uh, on this you. question, this also has to do with style. Uh, we had a, an informal conversation with graduate students before the, the, this uh, larger meeting, and I noticed that a couple of times in talking about your writing, you use the word fun. Mm -hmm. And so I, I can sometimes see when I read you uh, on the level of style that there is um, a particularly uh, unexpected metaphor or a, a, an unusual and arresting word choice. And uh, it's inventive. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I see he must be having fun doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is fun. And I do have fun. Um, I mean, it's also not fun, and I don't have fun. Um, <laughs> it's both, but you know, so, so, sometimes it goes well, and then it's fun, you know. Um, I do, I, 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 and I, and I feel like, you know, I, I, I hope that readers respond to that, that the pleasure that I, it's a sort of a cycle, the pleasure I take from reading, I try to, you know, transpose into my writing, which I then hope readers will take out of the writing. Mm -hmm. And, and um, but I also do feel sometimes there's a, I have noted in some of the reviews of my books over the years, there is a censoriousness afoot where that people sometimes seem to disapprove of fun. Um, and they, they sort of, they, you know, I've, I've, I've been accustomed to having a, a sentence that might appear in a review of my work saying, you know, some at time Shabon seems to be you know, having a little too much fun or uh, enjoying see. himself a little too much. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't really understand that. Um, it's a Protestant work ethic. I think it is, you know, and it's, and it, and sometimes this year, I, I love uh, Keith Jarrett, the piano player, Keith Jarrett, and, you know, he's kind of famous for making weird noises while he plays, like a lot of piano players do. Uh, you know, Glenn Gould too, and, and Oscar Peterson, and um, you can hear them on their recordings, and especially Jarrett, you can just, sometimes he, he just amazes himself, right? Like you, he, he runs something off, and then you hear him go like, whoa, <laughs> right? You know, and that, and when I hear that, I, I just, it makes me smile, and to, to sort of, to hear him taking pleasure in the notes that are coming out of his fingers, as if they're, they're surprising him as, as, as long, at the same time that they're surprising everyone in the audience is, is a source of additional pleasure to me listening to it. So, you know, it's a th I think it's okay if some of that comes through. Although, also, I know a lot of people listen to Keith Jarrett and they think that's really irritating, so. Well, to follow up on, on that, one thing I noticed, especially about your recent book, but this goes back at least as far as Cavalier and Clay. Well, um, they're all serious books in the sense that, that they deal with the kinds of problems that, that uh, we adults uh, struggle with mm -hmm. about love and, and identity mm -hmm. and, and so on. I, I don't have to make a catalog. And the Holocaust. Uh, 
And, uh, and the Holocaust. And the Holocaust, uh -huh. okay. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're terrific entertainments. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the, this critical response you, you talk about has to do with, with uh, uh, a certain bifurcation in the culture between serious writing, mm -hmm. uh, capital S, capital W, and entertainment, mm -hmm. which is okay, but it's... Uh, Lower, uh, lesser. Yeah. yeah, no, I definitely, I mean, I, I think that's very true, and I think it's, um, it's, not only is it pernicious and destructive, but I think it also flies in the face of what actual readers, actual experience of reading even the most serious, quote, you know, capital S yeah, texts yeah. is, you know, so that uh, part of what's going on, no matter what you're reading, like I mentioned Blood Meridian earlier, you know, that is a dark, violent, bloody, pessimistic, um, terrible book in, in mm -hmm. the yeah, original yeah, is, sense yeah. of the word terrible. Um, but I love it. Like, I, what I, while I'm reading it, I'm having an incredible sense of pleasure that I'm getting from the language, the cadence. Yeah, the, the, Talking the, the about language the King is James hypnotic. Bible. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, yeah. the same cadences are there. That you hear them in there. Because there are those echoes of Lincoln and, and um, Shakespeare and, and Melville um, in the prose, it's, it's the consciousness you're having of those echoes and, of, and the sound of the words themselves is... Is you know even when I'm reading about someone being scalped or or whatever it might be, I can't help it. There's a kind of, I mean, that's what reading ultimately. That's what reading is for, I think, and it's for pleasure. And but but that's not a bad thing. Pleasure is a good thing. And and not only that, but pleasure is a can be a means towards sort of. Um, I think it, it it can make you more receptive to whatever the serious intent. Of the artist might be, um, the, the, it makes you more willing to trust the artist. It makes you more willing to go along with the artist if you're also if if you're sort of being driven um, to read to continue reading by by just the sheer pleasure of the reading itself. And and so many great important novels um, that tackled searing social issues of injustice and you know the factory system or whatever it might be just aren't read anymore because they, they didn't deliver the goods when it came to, to pleasure. Um, so, I mean, for me, I, I, read, I write because I love to read and I love to read because reading is fun, because it's pleasurable. And, and that's what it all boils down to for me in the end. So, but, but, but there is this prejudice and, and, and writers, are, are, we ourselves have advanced it and contributed to it. And even, you know, so Graham Greene, you know, very carefully labeled his um, novels that were actually fun entertainments, yeah. you know, just to warn you um, or to, you know, protect the reader just in case, God forbid, you should have a good time um, yeah, reading right. a book. Um, and those to me are unquestionably like uh, Our Man in Havana, for example. Not only is it incredibly entertaining, but it's really profound and, and, mm -hmm. and without really trying as hard as the um, the power and the glory or something like that. Mm -hmm. it, it succeeds in conveying a really serious set, uh, several serious messages about imperialism and cultural imperialism and, and human frailty and, um, and the silliness and the nobility of human existence uh, without, with that kind of effortless quality. Whereas in other novels of his, I, they can seem so strained and, and forced upon you. It's been itchy. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'm, totally with you on this, and uh, as you talk, I think about a novelist, I know you, you like a lot also, Dickens. Oh, yeah. Who, after all, in a way, thought of himself as an entertainer, mm -hmm. and he, he was one of the most brilliant entertainers who ever wrote books. I mean, things are hilarious, uh, uh, sort of scary with suspense, mm -hmm. wonderful detective plots, mm -hmm. and so forth. But I, I don't think... Uh, Anybody wrote more persuasively about the maladies of Victorian England. Right, than absolutely. Right. And, and yeah, I mean, that's the thing is the idea is to try to do it all, right? To do everything, yeah. to, 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 do, to, to be incredibly entertaining and incredibly serious at the same time. And, and um, I think the best way of, the, well, there's two ways of doing that. You can try to be entertaining by being serious and you can try to be serious by being entertaining. Um, mm -hmm. I would prefer the second option, because right. at least you'll be entertaining, hopefully. 
<laughs> right. um, okay. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, a question having to do with a, a piece that it, it was not a review, an essay. I'm, I'm sure you saw it that Kate Roifey uh, published in the New York Times. Oh, Book yes, I saw that. You, you <laughs> thought this was coming at you, right? No, no. <laughs> nobody's asked me about this before, so this is... Well, for the benefit uh, of uh, the, the audience, the claim, and, and correct me, I, mean, I haven't reread it, so... Uh, no, neither I, have I. I may be a little fuzzy. Mm -hmm. uh, she said that in the, the generation of novelists, l let's put it brutally, now dying out, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, Updike, uh, of course, who died l last year, and Philip Roth, and Mailer. Bello, Mailer. Mm -hmm. uh, there was often a very elaborate, if you'll forgive the adjective, frontal treatment uh, of uh, sexuality. And uh, Roifey's claim was that in Michael Shabin's generation of American novels, and she mentioned you, mm -hmm. uh, that um, she sure did. This was the, the sex was no longer of interest. Right. Uh, uh, of course, this isn't quite true uh, of um, uh, mysteries uh, of Pittsburgh. Right. No, she conveniently neglected. Yeah, yeah. That a counterexample. Right. Right. Yeah. To her argument. But well, um, when do you talk about that? Well, you know, it seemed like a classic case of um, cherry picking kind of argument, where you make your point by conveniently ignoring everything that might seem That's to contradict to do it. it. <laughs> yeah, and it was in that sense, it was extremely well done. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, and so as you were reading it, it's like one of those, um, you know, suspense movies that as you're watching them, you're like, nobody would do that. Nobody would do that. Nobody would, like, no one would go through that door. Nobody would touch that bomb. You know, yeah, right. people are doing things, and, and so you never enter into the spirit of the movie because it's just violating all, all the rules of common sense and human behavior. And, and so while I was reading this article, like, I, you know, honestly, I didn't think I came in for especially rough treatment. It wasn't that oh, painful. No, it wasn't hostile. <laughs> it was just true. all you were thinking of was, well, but that's not true of this writer, and it's not true of, yeah, yeah. like, what about, and where are, and all the writers she talked about were all white. They were all, they were, they were all men. There was, there, well, there seemed the, to be. The men was part of her strategy. <laughs> right, exactly. The, the younger men now are not interested in sex Right, anymore. right, which, you know, I mean, may be true in you know the case of everybody else she was talking about um, i mean i i think i think what you know to me fundamentally what she neglected to consider that made the argument fatal i mean in addition to leaving out any possible counterexample there might have been yeah. um, was uh, that it's it's not that we're not interested in um, writing about sex, or not, I'll just talk for myself, not that I'm not interested in writing about sex, is that I'm really not interested in reading about it. Mm -hmm. and, and in those writers that she mentions and lionizes, God, those are the most dreary, boring parts of John Updike's <laughs> books, or like the 13-page descriptions of labias, and yes, you know right. what I mean? Like, <laughs> right, I, right. just, we're done. I it, do it, know what it, you mean. It, it was, it, it, it's so... Though that generation of men couldn't get laid when they were kids, you know, so they <laughs> they obsessed about it. They 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 needed to talk about it. They needed to write about it because they at some point the lid got taken off the pot and and it was okay. And 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 you know that's how we got the 1970s. But um, <laughs> that's when I came of age. So I came of age watching all of these people, male and female, uh, you know spill out over the sides of the pot once the lid got taken off. And it was, you know, it had its good points and its bad points, but it often wasn't a particularly edifying spectacle um, and, <laughs> and led people to wear shirts with wide lapels like this one. Um, <laughs> and, you know, while the updikes of the world were um, enjoying their adultery, and writing about it um, at great length and intimate detail, the children of the updikes of the world were um, watching their parents get divorced and and growing up kind of sexually um, confused and 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 um, a close near witness to the uh, intense destructive potential. You know, while while sex is being celebrated um, 
on the one hand, if you're the, the kid, you're looking up and you're watching all of the, um, the, you're not getting the celebration, you're getting to watch the kind of aftermath of the celebration. And I think, just speaking again for myself, I have a much more tempered view of the, li the possibilities that sex offers for personal liberation. Mm -hmm. um, I, and uh, having seen the, the downside of that, having grown up with the dark side of it and having come of age sexually, you know, just before the era of, of AIDS and so on, um, uh, it's not quite uh, such a clear case anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. The other part of it is, it's, like I said, it's just very boring to read about. And um, it brings out the worst in almost every writer, I think. Um, and there are very few writers who manage to write about sex in a way that um, seems like it's worth taking the time to do, at least to me, that persuades me that it's worth taking time to do. It's often very, it's either awkward or it's, that you feel a writer's awkward or just awkwardness or discomfort, or you feel the writer sort of fronting for the awkwardness and discomfort by kind of sort of, you know, posturing his or her way through it. And, um, and then it ends up calling attention to itself in a whole new way. Um, and I always think about this thing John Cheever said, and I, God, I don't want to hold John Cheever up as a model of sexual, um, you know, mm -hmm. balance. Um, mm -hmm. But he said something about, like, I'm tired of sex scenes. This was in the 60s he wrote this. Like, I'm tired of sex scenes, and I'm butchering his phrase in novels. Um, it's just like, it ends up being just like reading about how to change a tire. <laughs> <laughs> well... You know, as you talk about this, it, it, it occurs to me that some of the, the writers that Kate Roifey speaks of, of that generation, mm -hmm. maybe particularly Mailer and Philip Roth, ha, at times show a kind of redemptive vision of sex. Like, right. like the, uh, for Philip Roth to begin with, sex is the way he's going to, to break out of that prison house of middle class Yiddishkeit in New right, Jersey right. and of course uh, Mailer it's going to be the the, uh, the orgiastic experience right. of, oh you know like that 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 story the time of her time you probably know uh -huh. um, and um, maybe behind that a, a generation and a half behind that is D.H. Lawrence but probably at this point in time people have difficulty having redemptive notions. About well, sex. I mean, and ultimately sex is just a part of life. So, I mean, it's just like eating or sleeping and yeah. and it's as interesting as any of those other things are. And I guess those are as interesting as you can make them mm -hmm. um, uh, appear to be. But they're, it's, they're, it's not hyper interesting any more than food is um, or sleeping. Um, and, you know, so yeah, that was a generation that grew up seeing sex as having this possibility of incredible liberation. You know, I was in the generation that grew up with Three's Company on TV, Yeah. right? I mean, right, and yeah. sort of the whole TNA thing came along when I was about eight, nine years old. I suddenly mm -hmm. remember all of these people wringing their hands over, you know, the explicit sexuality that was being displayed on television. Right, got, right. Got, it probably seems like Pat Boone now, but in, mm -hmm. in, in, in comparison to what we have now, but still, uh, it just didn't have that kind of magical um, aura around yeah, it, see. you know, that it that it did. I think for earlier generations, like when I saw Carnal Knowledge for the first time, the movie of Carnal Knowledge, and I think I was about 18 or 17 the first time I saw that, it was like, it was like D.H. Lawrence or something even from before that. It seemed like this ancient document of this <laughs> remote, <laughs> forgotten time when you needed to practice how to, you know, t take a, open a girl's bra just in case it might ever happen, but it probably wasn't going to ever happen. Yeah, right. You know, just like, what, really? Yeah. Yeah. What's a where bra? I grew, yeah, where I grew up in Albany, New York, it never happened. Uh, exactly, yeah. see? <laughs> well, um, when I grew up, they taught classes in school on how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I'm going to preface my n next question by... Um, an anecdote that I heard a number of years ago from Steve Zipperstein, who teaches Jewish history at Stanford. He had Philip Roth as a, a 
VIP on campus for several days. Mm -hmm. So um, they were walking around and going to various seminars and so forth. And um, uh, um, at a certain point when they'd gotten uh, to a degree of rapport, Philip Roth turned to Steve Zipperstein and he says, tell me, I can't quite understand, how is it that a man of your intelligence spends all his time writing about the Jews? Wow. Uh, which was pretty funny. What did he mean by that? Yeah. <laughs> well, what about Philip Roth, right? Well, yeah, right. Hmm. Maybe he was being ironic. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I'm, um, I'd like to turn that question to you in, okay. in a little bit. That, that uh -huh. is, okay, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, it took me a while to get going in that regard, mm -hmm. you know, and... Uh, and for a long time, my first book, um, you know, was very sort of light. It was sort of had a light splash of Jew. Um, and uh, the second book, I sort of came in through the back door. And I, my main character, the narrator, is Gentile, but he attends his Passover Seder as a kind of, um, with a sort of, um, you know, defamiliarization uh, occurring where he's seeing all of these things like this plate full of crackers and a plate with a bone and an egg on it. And yeah, right, right. What, you know, just the whole experience is this kind of alien um, thing for him. And that was sort of my working, I think I was just working my way into um, fully embracing, fully owning, fully plunging myself into my Jewish heritage and my Jewish experience and upbringing and everything. Um, and since then, in a way, I guess I haven't really looked back or, or I, I probably would never be able to fully um, uh, pull myself back out of that now, having once, now that I've gotten into it. That being said, the novel that I'm working on now is set, it's the first novel I've written since Wonder Boys that's set in the present day. Um, that's not, it doesn't take place in an alternate reality or okay. some historical period. And while there are unquestionably Jewish characters right in the center of the book, I don't think it's a book that's overtly concerned with Jewish themes um, in particular. And I think that the books that began with, really began with Cavalier and Clay and then um, The Final Solution and the Yiddish Policeman's Union do form maybe a kind of a, not a trilogy really, but a, mm -hmm. a set of works that are concerned with um, the interrelationship between popular culture and Jewish culture and uh, the, with um, reflections and echoes and distortions of the Holocaust um, in popular culture um, so that, you know, I didn't ever, I never take it on quite direct, uh, directly in any of those books. It's, it's always either something that's happening off stage or in, um, in a different place, or um, in the case of the Yiddish Policeman's Union, that's something that happened in a different way, um, that, that played out historically in a different way. Um, I didn't do that consciously. I didn't set out to write three books that were gonna, right. you know, use detective fiction, Sherlock Holmes, hardball detective fiction, comic books, um, and so on to try to tangentially approach the question of what it means to be a Jew in America, what it means to um, have the, the Holocaust sort of always, it's this secondhand experience, this mediated experience um, that was never, that's something you did not experience directly. Um, but that's the way, I think it took me those three books in a way mm -hmm. to get through that material. And I'm not saying I won't return to it, but, but I, I do think it was something I felt like I needed to do to try to both integrate, because I was going through this double process of trying to integrate two things at once, to integrate my Jewish heritage, my Jewish upbringing, my family history, my family life, um, and my experience as an American Jew, uh, you know, coming of age um, when I did in the time of Hogan's Heroes. Um, you know, like that's my <laughs> first, my first experience yeah. of Second World War was Hogan's Heroes, you know? Okay. Think about that. <laughs> um, and also my sort of reintegrating a lot of the initial sources of my pleasure as a reader and my initial decision to become a writer. And I talked about Sherlock Holmes, but like genre fiction, genre literature, horror, science fiction, mysteries, crime fiction, supernatural, all of that stuff. 
Um, I had sort of, I seemed to myself to have left both of those strands behind. And it was in the course of trying to reintegrate them, but I didn't, again, I didn't do this so consciously. It just happened that way. Mm -hmm. They, that they, they both ended up feed, helping feed three works of fiction for me um, in a way that I, now I kind of feel like I might have completed the process and I've okay. sort of reincorporated those things. Well, let's talk just for a few minutes specifically about the Yiddish Policemen's uh, Union. And uh, I'll explain uh, for the audience, uh, uh, since I don't want to assume that everyone uh, has read it. This is a, a recent, two, 2007, is it? Yes. Uh, a recent novel, 2007, which is set, it's a, a counter-historical uh, uh, premise that the, um, during the uh, Second World War, uh, President Roosevelt has opened the gates to Jewish refugees from Eastern Europe, and some three million of them flood I into this territory in Alaska. And uh, th they um, basically create a, a kind of, for m most of them are native speakers of Yiddish, mm -hmm. so that they, they create uh, a, a kind of Yiddish-speaking commonwealth, which is about to lose it, it, its right. uh, status. They outstay their welcome. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, now, um, I guess I have a little cluster of <clears throat> questions. I find it quite fascinating uh, as a book. And it, for me, it's a wonderful example uh, of how a novel can be an entertainment, because it's really a kick to read this book, and, and quite serious at the same time. Uh, so uh, I'd like to know why this particular counter uh, historical uh, premise drew you, um, and then uh, a little bit. It seems to me that what you do with, with Yiddish is quite ingenious, uh, and maybe you might want to talk about that. And then uh, I noticed also that Esperanto is sneaking around uh -huh, there. Yes. So, so th that's my cluster yes. of questions. A novel causes a frisson of excitement in the Esperantist community <laughs> um, when it came out, which is what I was, you know, that's like the guarantee of success. So <laughs> my publisher was really happy about that too. Um, I, I wrote an article, an essay, many years ago now about this, in response to this little phrase book that I had come across um, one day in a bookstore in Orange County that is called Say It in Yiddish. And uh, some of you probably know this phrase book. A lot of Jews have bought it over the years. It's irresistible um, because um, it's, it's Say It in Yiddish and then underneath it says, a phrase book for travelers. <laughs> <laughs> and and as you know, as as straight faced. Well, I mean, that sounds like a joke, but it's it's also what's funny about it is because it's said so with such a straight face, and this whole book is so straight faced. It never, you know, it, I, I picked it up. I was like, this has to be a joke, right? And then I. You know, reading through, I'm looking like there's no indication anywhere that it is met in anything other than the most sincere um, interest of assisting the non Yiddish speaking traveler to this place where everyone speaks Yiddish, <laughs> where the trolley conductors and the post workers and the restaurant waiters in the restaurants and the doctors and the guy who pulls over to help you change a tire on your car and and everyone speaks Yiddish every single person from from the next door neighbor to the highest government official implicitly because of the phrase the chapters in this phrase book and the things that you are being instructed and in how to say everyone there speaks Yiddish and I thought you know like for my first reaction is like this has got to be a joke this has to be a hoax right mm. then my second reaction is like is there some place I, I don't know about? Like, <laughs> could I really have lived to the age, like maybe I was 28 when I first picked this book up. So I get like been on this planet for 28 years and I don't know about this place where they, <laughs> you know, like, no, that can't be. Um, and, and I had this book, I kept it around for many years and, um, you know, I, I kept it right by my desk and I used to look at it, I sometimes used it for, research when I needed a Yiddish phrase or an expression. Um, but I would just 
read it for pleasure. I just keep it there and flip through it, um, you know, when my mind was wandering a little bit. And at some point, I just got this itch to try to confront the book, address the book, and speculate about this book and what is it for? Mm -hmm. We know who, why was it written, but even more, why was it written? Where would you take it? And 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 guess okay, grant. Let's grant that there isn't anywhere, you know. And before somebody raises their hand and says Crown Heights or Maya Sharim or something like that, like you know, I'm sorry, no, you know, if I'm going to to Polish Hill in Pittsburgh, I don't take say it in Polish with me, you know. Like <laughs> you, when you're going to a neighborhood, you don't take a phrase book. Um, a phrase book is for taking to a country, um, and. You know, I thought, well, granted, the place to which I might take this book doesn't exist. And, 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 and following right on that statement is this feeling of sadness, right, of, of regret. Of, but once the joke is, once you're done laughing, your next emotion is, is regret, is wistfulness, is, is sorrow, is you wish there were such a place. Um, and then I started thinking, well, how might there have been such a place? Um, if there were, if there had been such a place, where might it have been? And in this essay, I, I wrote about how um, you know it wasn't likely, but it was at least possible that the state of Israel, the newborn state of Israel, might have chosen Yiddish to be the state language. I mean, there were there were partisans for that. There were people arguing for that. They obviously they lost out. But if that had happened, then you could have taken it to Yisroel. Um, it, then I thought about these other alternative, um, you know, places that aren't the former, you know, aren't the Holy Land, that aren't Palestine, that aren't this place where Hebrew had been spoken, um, but places where you would almost have to randomly choose a language if the Jews had been settled in Australia, if they'd been settled in Madagascar, if they'd been settled in Uganda, um, or if they'd been settled in Alaska, like this thing I remembered having read about in that little footnote to Jewish history, then it might have been even more logical to choose Yiddish than any other possible language. Um, and then the final thing I speculated about was then if the Holocaust had never occurred and if the six million had not been murdered, you know, that, that there were, I think there were about 18 million speakers of Yiddish in the world before World War II. Um, and, you know, this huge limb was lopped off the language in the Holocaust um, never to grow back. And, and, you know, the language, while still spoken and, and in many ways thriving and surviving, it has never been the same since then. Um, if that hadn't happened, you'd have all of these people that would be speaking Yiddish that would have had children and grandchildren. And, mm -hmm. and there, there might very well be a lot of parts of Europe where you could take this Yiddish phrase book. Um, that essay excited a lot of negative reaction in the Yiddish speaking community, the kind of like the Yiddish, amongst the Yiddish enthusiasts. Um, it might surprise you to learn that Yiddish enthusiasts can be kind of prickly and um, <laughs> contentious, I don't know. Um, um, and uh, a lot of people thought, well, I had done two terrible things. One, this book, this phrase book was written by Beatrice and Oriel Weinreich. Um, and I'm you know, now ashamed to admit that at the time, those names didn't mean anything to me. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know who Beatrice and Uriel Weinreich were. Um, I didn't know what Uriel Weinreich had done, which it turned out he had been, he was the son of Max Weinreich, who founded Evo, the Yiddish Institute. Um, and he um, himself was sort of this great hope of Yiddish scholarship. He and he died at the age of 40 and yeah. has been mourned ever since, you know, because he was so brilliant and so promising. And he, even in his short life, he had written a dictionary and in addition to this phrase book and, and uh, you know, had advanced the cause of Yiddish scholarship so much and then he was killed young. So I seem to be mocking this admittedly minor production of a great hero. Um, and then also I seem to be, to some readers, to be mocking the Yiddish language itself, to almost be kicking it when it was down or to be saying, or that the, the reason this book is funny is because Yiddish is a dead language. That's what's funny about it. As if that were what would be funny about anything. Like say it in Latin is not funny. Nobody would think that was, you know, a funny book. Um, what was funny about it was it was said in Yiddish. That was what was funny about it. But, but um, no, what was funny about it was because it seemed to assume something that was almost possible. It was just possible enough that 
it had that poignancy. So um, my response to that, to having caused that kind of um, offense and outrage was to try to um, create more um, by <laughs> writing an entire novel that would be set in this Yiddish speaking district in Alaska and see if I could offend even more people um, by doing that because, you know, I'm a, it's off to look us. I just was trying to spite people. Um, mm -hmm. No, I, I just had this sense that I was right, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that there was, there was something really poignant about this, that there was something that might have, it was something that might have been and something, and it was a place I wished I could see with my own eyes. And, and the surest way to see those places that you wish you could see is you know, to write about them. That's why I wrote about New York in the 1940s. Um, you, asked, you asked about the, the Yiddish itself, the language itself yeah. in the book. And um, you know, once I presented myself with the problem of a place where Yiddish has been spoken in the modern world, in a modern industrial capitalist American, context for the past 60 years, it's clearly not going to be the same Yiddish um, as when in. It can't, it's going to come out differently. It's going to have a lot of influence from English. It's, I mean, American Yiddish already was changed and altered during the immigrant period by the exposure to English. That process would have just continued. Um, there would be new words, new slang, when, when cell phones get invented, they have to come up with a name for cell phones yes, I, in Yiddish. I love and, your invention of slang and names for cell Right, phones. exactly. And, and for me, I mean, I wasn't going to write the book in Yiddish, yeah. obviously, because I can't. Um, <laughs> but I wanted it to f almost to feel, what I, well, I, not almost, I wanted to feel as if it were, had been written in Yiddish, in the particular Yiddish spoken by a, a Yid, as he calls himself, of, of Sitka, Alaska in, in 2007. Um, and then translated by me into English, in an English that hopefully was going to preserve the flavor of the original. And part of the way of doing that was when, I, when there was a term that was translatable, I would translate it. But then there would be these certain terms that were, that were slang terms that weren't necessarily translatable. If you translated them, you would lose the, the flavor, so I would leave them in the original Yiddish. So like a word like... Um, well, like the detectives call themselves shamuses. So a shamus is, um, that seemed like the right term to me because a shamus is um, both, you know, the, the sext and the beetle of a synagogue, the guy who takes care of it. And, and many people believe that from that comes the word shamus, which means the detective, although other people think there's a Gaelic origin for that word. Um, but, um, you know, I tried to find terms that felt like they would have evolved naturally. And um, another example is um, the word for gun, the slang term for gun is a sholem. And I had been reading about how Yiddish slang really worked. Um, you know, criminal slang, musician slang, Yiddish speakers, almost without exception, were at least trilingual. You know, they spoke like Polish, Russian, and Yiddish, or or German, Yiddish, and, and Polish, or whatever it might have been. And because they were trial, they tended, to, or then, then the Hebrew, of course, too. Right. So four languages. Um, they, they were very comfortable with multilingual puns. And so multilingual puns would play, would come in. And then now I can't remember the word, but the Yiddish slang, criminal slang for a jail is the Hebrew word for goat, which I don't remember what that is. But the, but because the Polish word for goat is a homonym for the Polish word for jail. So, or something like that. So like you had to know all of that to get up to, to know that when I say this in Yiddish, goat in Hebrew, it's, this is the reason why. And so for me, Sholem did the same thing because Sholem means peace, peace and a peace is a peace yeah. is a gun. So, you know, I tried to do some of that. Now, uh, would you say just a, a few words about how Esperanto fits it. Oh, right, yeah, Esperanto. Right. Well, the poignance, the wistful quality that's caught up with language seemed to me to be a part of Esperanto in a way, too. That, and, and, I, and I knew or I discovered in the course of doing a lot of reading about Yiddish for writing this novel that um, Zamenhof, the inventor of Yiddish, uh, of uh, of uh, Esperanto, sorry, the inventor of Yiddish. That'd be a good title. 
Um, the, the inventor of Esperanto grew up as a native speaker of Yiddish. Yes. And it was his experience of watching Jews from all over, you know, from Poland, Russia, Romania, wherever they would get together, they could all speak Yiddish. It was a universal language of, mm -hmm. of, of, of you know, Yiddishland. So he had this direct personal experience of a universal language, which supposedly gave him the idea for, for Esperanto. Um, and Esperanto, um, what appealed to me about it was it was the fact that it was a fail, you know, it has been a failure. Apologies to whatever Esperantists there might be out, out there, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it never caught on the way we might have hoped, and I'm sure the world would be a much better place if it had, but, right. but it was that sort of failed quality because this, this to me, um, in spite of, the, of people who have accused me of trying to argue in this book that I, you know, that there should be no Israel, the world's better off without an Israel, and, and here's the wonderful alternative. To me, I viewed this Sitka as being a failure um, on many levels, and you know, chief among which is the fact that these people who live there are, have no control over their own destiny, and when they're shown the door, they have to leave, mm -hmm. which is what's going on in the background of this novel. Um, and it was that sort of, they started with hope, they, were, they had been admitted, they had been let out of Europe, they escaped the horrible fate that awaited them in Europe, they came to America, um, they started all over again, they built this new homeland, there was all this promise and opportunity and now it's all sort of been, um, it's all being um, um, thrown away and that sense of lost hope, of squandered hope, seemed to me to be embodied as well in Esperanto. So you have this hotel, yeah, the Hotel nice. Zamenhof, yeah. who, right. which is just a cheap flop house. And, and at one time, everything was labeled in Esperanto, but somebody broke off all the labels and stole mm -hmm. all, the, all the labels. And so there's just a few little signs here and there that say Elevatoro and things like that. And, and this the ghost of Esperanto, of Zamenhof's vision, kind of haunts this place. Now, I want you to know that, that even <coughs> grand failures have their moments of success. Maybe True. that's partly what the novel is about. Uh, many years ago, my wife and I were, were visiting uh, the uh, journalist um, um, Amos Elon, who uh -huh. died last year, sure. in, in, who lived most of the time with his wife in a small town in Italy. And we went to a betrothal luncheon at a, a local pizzeria. Uh, a young man who was an auto mechanic in town was an Esperanto buff, uh -huh. and he had gone to Prague, and he had this list of, of people who did Esperan Esperanto in Prague, and he met this young woman. Uh, the only language oh that they God, shared so was cool. Esperanto. Well, there you go. Yeah. I know. It's, it's a beautiful thing when it works. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. It works with uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, yeah. too, though. Le Le so like we, we should leave a few minutes for questions for the audience. Okay. But let me ask what, one last question. Uh, would you uh, say a few words about novelists, American or, or others, oh, sure. I thought who you were going to ask me to say a few words in Esperanto. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, novelists who have been important to me, living, dead? <laughs> and, anyway. I should probably just do the dead one so I won't <laughs> offend. Um, you know, right. anybody who I don't mention who's alive. Um, well, the writers who's, I, 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 I'm not very daring in my reading habits. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very sedentary, stay-at-home kind of person. I don't like, I don't like to, um, I, I, that's why I married my wife, because she forces me to go places and do things. Um, <laughs> Um, by making it impossible for me not to. So, um, you know, at her instigation, we travel, and I, and I have a wonderful time, and I'm always glad, but all I ever want to do is stay home. And it's kind of that way with reading as well. Um, I just keep rereading the same writers, the same books over and over again, um, coming back to them, either filling in gaps and books by that writer I haven't read before, or just rereading the same books over and over again. So the writers whose work I return to, um, most often, I probably say are Edgar Allan Poe, um, Raymond Chandler, uh, Gustave Flaubert, um, uh, Marcel Proust, um, Eudora Welty. I mean, there's just certain people. Where I, I, I mean, I will mention one living writer, um, Michael Andache. 
Um, you know, mm -hmm. there's certain books, certain writers, certain books that I just feel like no matter how many times I read them, I never get to the bottom of that book. So for me, like a book like um, uh, The English Patient, or I love one of his early books, Coming Through Slaughter, um, Andachi's early books, or a book like um, The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym by Edgar Allan Poe, or Blood Meridian, which is now the third time I've mentioned that tonight. But, um, you know, they're, they're just, every time, first of all, I look over and I see them on the shelf and they just start calling to me, like, yes, I'm still here, come back. <laughs> um, you know, and, and other books just don't make that kind of appeal. Um, and, and then when I do pick them up, it's with this sense of, I can't, I can't believe I'm so lucky that I get to read this book again. Mm -hmm. um, Charles Dickens is another, would be another example. Um, um, Bleak House, Great Expectations, those books, you know. I just, every time I pick them up, I'm, I'm so glad I get to do it again. Right. Um, it's like going to Disneyland and going on Space Mountain again. Um, so, but you know, it takes like three or four people who I trust and whose opinion means a lot to me um, to recommend the same book by a new, a new book by a new writer before I will say, oh, okay, I'll, I'll read that. Um, I guess I'll, I'll mention another contemporary writer whose work I really love is Richard Price. Um, talk about tough Jews. Mm -hmm. um, uh, his novel, I love his novel, Samaritan, Clockers, obviously. I liked his last book quite a lot. Um, um, Zadie Smith, the English writer, I love her work. Reread On Beauty twice now. That's one I'll probably come back to again. I like the first White Teeth. White Teeth is great too. Yeah. White yeah. Teeth is fun, definitely yeah. fun. Okay, well, I, I think the moment has come for us to turn to the audience. And since somewhat to my dismay, I learned that there isn't a mobile microphone out there for you. And I, I don't trust the acoustics of uh, uh, Wheeler Auditorium. Whoever asks a question, I would implore to speak out big and loud. Okay. If there are enough Jews in the audience, that shouldn't be a problem, <laughs> in my experience. <clears throat> Louder! That's what I always hear when I'm like 92nd Street wide. Yes. How did you like your, uh, how did you like the way they did Wonder Boy in the movie? Everyone heard that? I'll repeat it. Yeah. How did I like the way they did Wonder Boys in the movie? Um, uh, I was delighted by it. Wonder Boys is a great movie, and it's held up really well, too. I saw it again. I saw it you know, a few times when it came out and then didn't see it again for, uh, until very recently when I had the strange experience of watching it with my oldest child, my daughter, Sophie, um, who loved it, and um, not enough to make her want to actually read the book on which it was based, however. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, it was written by a really talented writer, Steve Clovis, the screenwriter, and directed by a great director, Curtis Hansen, great cast, Robert Downey Jr., Michael Douglas is wonderful in it, Francis McDormand. Um, it was good all around. Just as a movie fan, I, if I had had nothing to do with that movie whatsoever, I would have liked it, you know, I would have enjoyed it. Um, I think it was, it was great. And, and I, I saw people's best movies of the decade lists when when we turned into this decade it was on a lot of those lists whereas the book it was based on was not <laughs> yes yeah in the second row here Have I been more interested in delving more into screenwriting? And you mentioned Richard Price. I mean, Richard Price is probably my, he's my role model in terms of having a successful career as a novelist. And when I say successful, I mean, I mean just artistically successful, that he writes beautiful novels. And he's made a good living producing really good work in Hollywood and as a TV writer for The Wire, as you mentioned. And, um, um, you know, I enjoy watching and listening to his screenplays almost as much as I enjoy reading his novels. Um, 
and yes, I do. I'm actually doing a lot of screenwriting these days, and and it's always been. I've been lucky. I got my foot in the door um, in the mid '90s and started. I wrote an original screenplay that was optioned and never was made, but that opened the door enough for me that I've been able to keep working, doing one kind of screenwriting or another um, as a way of supplementing the novel writing income because um, you know it's you have to find something and a lot of writers teach um, to do that and, and but I've been able to do it by virtue of screenwriting so far, knock on wood. Um, right now my only credit is the Spider-Man 2 um, credit, which I didn't, I didn't write the script for that. I had, I was one of many writers on that, and I, but I did get a credit for that. Um, I worked on a movie that's in production right now, which is a live action Disney adaptation of Edgar Rice Burroughs' Mars, John Carter of Mars, Ooh. which some of you <laughs> might, might fun, know those books. Um, and, uh, that was a great experience, and it, so that one's making its way to the screen. It's being filmed right now, so maybe I'm on a on an ups, upswing in terms of actually getting things produced. But the cool thing about Hollywood is that they pay you whether they produce it or not. So, <laughs> so either way, it that, works. That's a little like the academic world where they pay you whether you produce exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> Very similar. Very similar. Uh, who else? Yes. Oh, M.R. James. Maybe, uh, yeah. How he, I'm not sure if it was his name, but he writes these stories uh, that are very like, heartfelt and uh, very humanistic, but he talks about how it's personalized. He never expresses love or anything. Um, wow. And then uh, uh, this, is, this is a two part question. Okay. Oh, right, right. Okay, so then you basically go on to say how you went out and... Got myself some sadness. Yeah. yeah. Um, so contrasting yourself with this first writer, how important was it for you to go out and find that? Well... <laughs> yeah, wait, did, could everyone hear the question? No, I'll repeat it. So I guess the question is, I guess I'll try to... I'll, I'll try to rephrase the question and you tell me if I'm messing it up. But I guess it's basically a question about the role that actual lived experience of adversity and heartache and sorrow and, and um, other things like that um, play in the, in, in, the, in the life of a writer and in the work of a writer, how important and necessary it is to sort of put yourself out there into the real world and have bad things happen and get in trouble and no joy and sorrow in their extremes and all of that. Um, and the example was cited back to me of this, I think of M.R. James, an English writer of um, ghost stories, really great ghost stories, uh, who should be better known in this country um, than he is. But he, he, on the surface at least, as much as we know about him, seemed to lead this sort of very um, quiet, contemplative life in which nothing really terrible happened to him and he and he traveled a little bit to Scandinavia and other very temperate places where nothing bad befell him and and he was an uh, Eton teacher at Eton College and and had this sort of quiet uninteresting perhaps existence um, and yet wrote these really dark ghost stories in which horrible things are constantly befalling um, people who bear a fairly strong resemblance to him in, the, in that they're scholarly, donish kind of people um, who lead what seem to be quiet, ordinary lives. Um, you know, I think, I don't know if Flannery O'Connor really did say this. Supposedly, Flannery O'Connor said something to the effect of anybody who lives to the age of five or seven or I don't know what it is, you know, has enough material as a writer to last them the rest of their lives. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think the experience of any childhood, um, just no matter how superficially 
protective and and benevolent it might seem to be um, is so fraught with danger and terror and horror and confusion and doubt and uncertainty and scary grown-up people um, yelling and all the things that childhood is fraught with. I actually do believe that's true. And I know, for example, that M.R. James was raised in this pretty strict religious um, household where you weren't really allowed to do anything or have any fun at all. And, and that knowing children as I do, I think enforcing that must have involved a certain amount of discipline. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think it's possible to be human and live a life that in which material could not be find, found to produce, you know, a matter for at least one short story. Um, <laughs> maybe no more than that, but, but um, I do, I mean, I, I think it is important to get out there especially when you're young. And, and when people are young, and I meet people who are young and they want to be writers, I tend to encourage them to not worry about writing so much. Read, worry about reading, and read as much as you possibly can. And don't accept excuses from yourself about that. But go out and do stuff and go places and have fun and do things and don't sweat it too much if you're not getting a whole lot of writing done, because there'll be time for that eventually to sit down and be boring and stay home which you do have to do to get your writing done. But I do think, I mean, that friend of mine who was, I wrote about who was berating me when I was young for young man for you know, not having a sufficient quantity of what he called tristeza, um, or maybe he called it tristeza, I don't know. Um, you know, he, he, he himself was one of the people who was sort of providing me with that in a sense, you know? <laughs> and, and in fact, for a long time in my life, I saw it very actively, recognizing that I was kind of, I'm, sedentary is not the right word, but I'm, I am a little timid. I am a little, I'm, I'm not gonna be the first person to jump off or even the second person to jump off. I might be the third or the fourth person to jump off. Um, and recognizing that, I was, always, I, I was always very attracted to people who were troublemakers. Who did? Who were the first person to jump off? Who, who had this, the crazy ideas, the stupid ideas? The who cooked up schemes and roped people into them? Um, you know, I've always been attracted to that, my, and my wife is definitely that kind of a person. She's a straw that stirs many drinks, and you know, I, I mean, that is still something that I, I, I seek out that I look for. So Dave Eggers, the, the great writer who lives over in Marin County is another person like that. Not that he's a troublemaker, but, but anymore. Um, but, um, but he is a straw who stirs the drink. You know, he, he, he makes things happen. He, he, he gets people around him to come up with ideas that they wouldn't otherwise have come up with. And then he says, well, why haven't you done it yet? And um, those people are very necessary, generally speaking, and in my life in particular. But not not because I need them to help me get things to write about so much as just because life's really dull and boring without them. And unrewarding. Let's see. Uh, let's go toward the back there, you. Uh, the, yes. Um, so right, the person in the blue top. Oh, go ahead. Oh, OK, go ahead. Nice and loud. If we if I we were just talking about a serious man in um, the the little talk that I did before yeah. this, have I seen a serious man and what did I think of it? Um, well, I have to say first of all, I am a big Coen Brothers fan, I, and some of their movies like The Big Lebowski and Miller's Crossing and Fargo and um, Blood Simple, um, and I, I really like The Man Who Wasn't There. Those are some of my favorite movies, and I've watched them over and over and over again, and will continue to do so with pleasure. Um, that being said, the I was pretty excited to hear that they had made this movie that had this very overt Jewish content, which is what I had heard. You know, that's all I had heard. Like, this new Coen Brothers movie is really Jewish. That's what I heard. Um, and that's true. It is really Jewish. It's crazy Jewish. Right. I mean, it might be one of the most <laughs> Jewish American movie, you know, most Jewish space American movies ever made, I think. Um, uh, more than Yentl, even. Um, <laughs> But, but I really didn't 
get it. I just did not engage with it on almost any level that I thought I would. So maybe my expectations played a part in that, but I just, I really felt removed from it and then was kind of eager for it to be over, um, like a dental procedure. Um, <laughs> there was one part of it that I just love, one thing in it that I love is, is the, the rabbi who confiscates the kid. What does he take from him? His, oh, yeah, and he snatches it. The, he snatches it and he opens that drawer and, he, and you see that shot of all of the things that he's confiscated, like there's a gyroscope and I don't know what all, packs of gum. And, and it's just that to me, that, there was more pleasure contained in that one shot than in the entire rest of the movie. But um, it was kind of cool to see them doing that kind of thing. And I know people who grew up in Jewish Minneapolis who say it's you know, chillingly um, accurate representation of how they remember it, at least how they remember it looking. Um, but that didn't, that wasn't enough for me. Yes, you. Thank you. The memory hole, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or the artwork ends up in the trash. And when I read that, an analogy came very readily to my mind with my own experience of reading. And I'm not sure I even had it all worked out yet in my mind, but I wonder whether you have a similar experience yourself. Sometimes reading very, very good writers, I come across passages, lines, phrases that are so wonderful and that feel like something I want to cherish and hold on to. But it Right, right, right. Yes, no, I mean, that's true, that's right, and, I, and it is that way with life in general and with certainly with children and raising children, and, you know, like, I hate taking pictures. I hate, I hate the interrupting what's happening to preserve it, you know? Um, and yet, on the other hand, when you don't take pictures and you don't preserve it, then it's gone. It really is gone. And you can kid yourself all you want. I'll, I'll never forget this moment. Um, but you do. You do forget them. And all you can remember are the things you can remember, right? And the things that you can't remember, you forget. And they're gone. And you'll never, you know, and, and, and you have that chilling experience sometimes, that, that, the instructively chilling experience of, of having someone come up and remind you of something that you have totally forgotten, oh, right? Yeah. Until that moment, like 30 years ago, do you remember blah, blah, blah? And you'll be like, oh, I do remember that. And I remember it now that you mention it, you know, I remember. So just, I mean, that's, every other moment of your life that you didn't take a picture of <laughs> is gone, right? You're, it's forgotten. Um, and it is like that with reading too, and I do hate, and I am not a note taker, and I hate, I, hate, I hate just having to flip to the back to the notes and see if I know what, what you know, the word Brahm means or something like that, whether, whether how a Brahm is different than a handsome or something like that. You know, I hate that interrupting the flow of the reading long enough to do that. Um, the difference is, and what makes it so painful with kids, with your kids, and you know, I, and I was writing in that piece, as you mentioned, about the experience of throwing away my children's artwork, um, which we routinely do, um, because there's just so much of it, and you know, you can't keep everything. Um, the difference is that you can't go back. You know, with a book, Yes, so like you, you, you should have written down this beautiful thing that, that you know, that um, Christopher Isherwood says in, in, in Berlin Diaries about something or other and you didn't because you were enjoying it so much, but you can go back. You can pick up Berlin Diaries and reread it and, and find that piece and, and, and you can't do that with your kids' lives. You never, you don't ever get to go back and I mean, that's what makes it so, so much more terrible. Um, when you have that experience of realizing like, um, you know, and when you, or say you stumble across a photo of, of your kid where you're just, um, I was watching, I made a copy of a video for my wife and I dubbed it uh, of a, some home video kind of thing. And on the back of it, erased over, was this little snippet of another earlier video of one of my kids when she was a baby. And just 
and like everything, the, the room she was in was not our house. It was like the room she was in, the clothes she was wearing, the way she looked, every single aspect of this image of her sitting in this high chair holding a spoon, um, I had forgotten. You know, like I had forgotten the day it was filmed. I had forgotten the clothes. Like as soon as I saw, like I remember that outfit. I remember that person's house we were at. I remember the food. I remember all of it. And, but I had completely and utterly forgotten it until it just chanced upon that thing. And when that happens, that's when you realize, you know, you've just, you're just burning through your days. You're just burning through them. Your, your, your head is down. You're doing what you need to do. You're focusing on the nearest ta task at hand. And then maybe if you're a reasonably mature person, you've got like a few things down the line that you're also focusing on that you know are coming up that you're going to have to deal with. Um, and that's it. You know, and, and it's so rare that you lift your head up and you look around and you take note and you remember. And, and, and the horrible thing is even when you do do that and you say, like, remember this. Like, you know, like, I'm going to remember my son saying this incredibly profound, weedy, wise thing he said. And it's just, it, I don't. It's a lie. I forget it. It's gone. So, but what are you going to do? Yeah. Take pictures. I think we have time for just Keep a one journal. more question. Yes? Who does that? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Um, I mean, he, Andachi is a good example. I mean, I know he does still write poetry, but I am. Um, I, you know, it's very hard to say this without sounding like boastful or pretentious, but I really do consider. I don't consider there's any difference between what I write and poetry, in that I, having written poetry at a certain period that was overtly poetry, self-declared poetry, self-avowed poetry, and having learned that a poet's job is to take care with every word and to attend to the rhythm of a line and worry about the caesuras and line breaks and, and word choice and and puns and multiple meanings and, and assonance and consonance and alliteration and all of the things that a poet is supposed to be doing when he or she is writing a poem with language. I've, I do all those things. I, I sweat over my sentences every bit as much when I'm writing prose as, as I did when I was trying to write poetry, so, so called. And, um, and I am heartened when I look at a writer like Andachi, for example. Um, or Edgar Allan Poe, for that matter. Um, you know, um, he, to me, when I read his best work, his best prose work, like The Fall of the House of Usher is a good example. It's, it is a, it's a poem, as much as it is a short story. And you can even see in Poe, if you look closely, he has, you know, not just alliteration and consonants and essence, but he actually has meter buried in his sentences. And I, and I, um, well, often when I'm writing, I will be hearing a kind of ragged meter, but a meter nonetheless, as I'm creating pro sentences where I, I, I have, I get the sense of like, I need a two syllable word to end this sentence and it has to have the accent on the first syllable or this sentence isn't going to sound right. Um, and I will try a number of different words until I find the right one that has the meaning I want, but also scans properly. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, when, so people ask me, you know, do you ever write poetry? Um, and I always say, well, I did in college or in high school, I, I tried to write poetry. Um, but, you know, I always feel like the more honest answer would be like, I, yes, I do, every damn day. <laughs> you know, to, to, to push the uh, uh, boundaries of genre still further, I have to confess, uh, this is one way which uh, I'm sort of a nut, that even when I'm writing the critical, only way, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but even when I'm writing critical essays, I, I find myself doing the same thing. I, you know, I need a two-syllable word with a second-syllable accent right. to end the sentence, or the sentence is a wreck. Right. No, I mean yeah. you. You're hearing. You're yeah, hearing right, it, right? right? And right. there's an internal voice that's talking, yeah. um, and. Uh, I feel the words as a kind of pulse or as a structure of rhythm, like sort of infinite instant, like instantaneous little moments before mm -hmm. the actual words themselves come to me. I kind of yeah, get the, the pulse of the sentence. Well, 
Uh, I think <laughs> that Michael Shabin's conversation this e evening has beautifully illustrated how he can be serious and even illuminating at the, and at the same time enormously entertaining. So please join me in uh, expressing Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thanks, Bob.